we are seeing a dramatic increase, not only in obesity and hypertension and diabetes and also kidney disease over the last century. This has been associated with a dramatic increase in coronary artery disease. In 1913, coronary artery disease was first described pathologically. In 1929, Robert Platt said, for the first time, the family physician is seeing angina. In 1940, cardiology began as a discipline. In 1950, there were only 500 cardiologists in the United States. Today, there's over 35,000 performing more than 1 million coronary angiograms. There's more than 1 million cardiovascular surgeries a year. Cardiovascular mortality has slowed. In fact, per capita, it's now decreasing, leading some people to say that cardiovascular epidemic is no longer present. Hogwash. The problem is that so long as diabetes and hypertension and obesity are increasing, we're going to see more heart disease. We're going to see more strokes. The reason that mortality is slowed is because we're learning better how to treat cardiovascular disease with antihypertensives, statins, thrombolytics, stents, and surgery. What we have to do is we have to address this global epidemic that is occurring throughout the world and affecting all populations and has taken over in the last uh, 100 years. It's not just affecting the United States and it's not just, it's affected all populations, especially indigenous populations. The Pima Indian, the Maori Indian, the Australian Aborigine, the Native American, they were all normal tensive with almost no diabetes, no uh, obesity before the Western culture was introduced. This is very well documented. So what is it that's driving this epidemic in the West and that brought this uh, to its fray? Well, the first, a lot of people thought that it was just eating too much and exercising too little. But back in the 1950s, the first major breakthrough was by a guy named Ansel Keys, a nutritionist from Minnesota, who suggested that perhaps there's something in the diet some specific food in the diet that could be causing obesity. He said, you know, in atherosclerotic disease, you pull out these big, rich, fatty cholesterol plaques. It must be cholesterol. It must be saturated fat. And when he looked, he found that there was a direct relationship in different countries between the saturated fat in intake and the frequency of coronary artery disease. He made a compelling case in the 1950s that high-fat diets were the cause of obesity were the cause of cardiovascular disease, and every society agreed with him. And so the low-fat diet became the primary way to treat obesity and the tr primary way to prevent heart disease. There was only one problem. The Women's Health Initiative, among other many studies, has shown that low-fat diets don't protect against cardiovascular disease. Here, low-fat diet versus controlled diet, the Women's Health Initiative on heart attacks and strokes. Do you see a difference? You see one line, don't you? There was no effect of low-fat diets on preventing cardiovascular disease. Low-fat diets do work briefly for weight loss, but they don't, can't be sustained. So what's the problem? Was Ansel Keys wrong? Was there, is there another possible mechanism? Well, back in the 1960s, there was another nutritionist based in London named John Yutkin. And Yutkin said, well, you know, Keys isn't wrong in the fact that high fat intake correlates with heart disease, but high fat intake also correlates with sugar intake. And not only that, in various countries, sugar intake correlates with heart disease. Maybe it's sugar that's driving the cardiovascular epidemic. Maybe it's sugar that's driving obesity. But he wasn't a very good orator, and when he would get up in front and debate uh, Ansel Keys, he usually lost, and, and so the sugar hypothesis more or less fell into uh, oblivion. But we're going to revisit that theory today. With, uh, and so we're going to talk about sugar. Sugar is sucrose. It's a disaccharide. It consists of one molecule of glucose and fructose bound together. Fructose is also present in honey and fruit. But it was also introduced in the early 1970s as a sweetener, which, a, a type of sugar sweetener called high fructose corn syrup. And there it's mixed as a free fructose and glucose combination. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because there are studies that were done in the 1950s showing that if you feed sugar to animals, that they become pre-diabetic and fat. They develop what we call the metabolic syndrome, where your triglycerides go up, your HDL cholesterol falls, you develop insulin resistance, you get obesity, you get intra-abdominal fat, you get inflammation, you get fatty liver. And when further studies were done, it was shown that it wasn't just sugar that did it, it was the fructose element. 
You could give animals fructose or the animal starch and only the fructose or sugar-fed animals will develop pre-metabolic syndrome or pre-diabetes. This is a study we did. We took rats and we pair-fed them. So this group got glucose or starch and this group got fructose. They ate the exact same number of calories. But blood pressure goes up in the fructose-fed animals, triglycerides go up, HDL cholesterol goes down, insulin resistance develops only in the fructose-fed animals. We've even shown that you can starve an animal, you can restrict its caloric intake, but if you give it fructose, it won't gain weight because it's being starved, but when you open it up at sacrifice, there's a dramatic increase in intra-abdominal fat, insulin resistance, hypertriglyceridemia, and all the factors that we know lead to diabetes. So why is fructose different from glucose? Well, fructose is different from glucose because of its first three enzymes involved in its metabolism. Fructose enters cells through a specific transporter where it's metabolized by an enzyme called fructokinase. Fructokinase is an unregulated enzyme. Unlike glucokinase, which metabolizes glucose, glucokinase generates ATP, uh, the glucose pathway generates ATP, and you never see ATP uh, depletion. But with fructose, you become energy depleted. Remember, your primary energy is, comes from ATP, and ATP gets burned and then consumed. So you get this rapid burn, and then you get this uh, ATP depletion. And if you give fructose on cells, even at the concentration you get from drinking one soft drink, one millimolar will, will deplete the energy of the cell by 30 to 40 percent, and protein synthesis will arrest. And we've shown that. It's been shown by other groups. We've shown it in endothelial cells, hepatocytes, tubular cells, adipocytes, you know, all kinds of cells in the body, and it's been shown in humans. If you give an injection of fructose to a human, you can measure ATP or energy in their liver and it goes down dramatically by NMR and also by specific biopsy. But while I was doing this, I realized that fructose, by raising uric acid and inhibiting nitric oxide, would completely block the effects of glucose to stimulate insulin uh, to, a great, to increase glucose uptake in the muscle. One third of glucose's action is through nitric oxide. And I thought, if this goes up at the same time, fructose might be the cause of insulin resistance in humans. So what we did is, and uric acid, through uric acid, so what we did is we took rats and we gave them very high doses of fructose. We can do it with small doses if we inhibit uricase. And when we give very high doses of fructose, we could raise the uric acid, they develop hypertension, and when we lowered the uric acid, their blood pressure fell, their triglycerides fell, their insulin resistance improved, and if we gave it prophylactically, we could prevent weight gain. Not only that, we now have a clinical trial in people that is confirming the weight gain effects of allopurinol, or the weight loss, negative weight gain. So, could fructose be the driving force of the epidemic? Fructose-rich diets raise blood pressure, triglycerides, induce insulin resistance and weight gain. In other words, it causes this pre-diabetes syndrome. Humans are taking this diet without IRB approval. Metabolic syndrome has a major role in driving hypertension and kidney disease. And these are some of the effects. I don't have a lot of time to go through it, so I'm just going to point out that we, our group and others have shown that fructose causes leptin resistance in rats where they keep eating. It's acutely a neurostimulant, it works through dopamine, but later it causes dementia and strokes by causing vascular disease to the brain. Uh, it causes fatty liver, we can do that in animals. High fructose corn syrup actually induces fatty liver more than sucrose for the same caloric intake. It raises, causes inflammation. Uh, it's associated with a lot of renal effects. It accelerates kidney disease in animals. It induces oxidative stress, and it probably has a role in preeclampsia. So could fructose be the driving force? We've also just finished a study in Menorca where we gave fructose for two weeks to healthy people, and look what happened. The blood pressure went up. The triglycerides went up. The HDL cholesterol fell. Insulin resistance went up. Uric acid went up. And even a test of fatty liver went up. And not only that, they spontaneously quit exercising by 50%. And it makes sense because fructose causes energy depletion. 